Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. I'd like to welcome everyone today to our webinar and we're in the webinar series. We're very privileged to have Tom Matthews with us today from the Wildlife Management Institute. My name is Andrew Kling. I'm a program assistant with the University of Maryland Extension Woodland Stewardship Education Program at the Western Maryland Research and Education Center in Washington County. If you joined us for the first time today, welcome. We're glad to have you along. And if you've joined us before, welcome back. Uh, before we get started, before I hand things over to Tom, we have a few things to go over. A couple of details to, uh, to work out and make sure everyone's on the same page. And then we'll get started. First thing you need to know is we do have these webinars on a fairly regular basis. We have one more scheduled for next month and possibly a second in June. If you're interested in learning more about these, the best way to keep on top of it is by joining our email notification list. And there's two ways you can do that. You can send an email to listserv at listserv.umd.edu, or you can drop me a line at akling1 at umd.edu. And each email that comes out that we send out tells you a little bit about what the topic is, when it's going to be held, and some advice on how to connect and where to go to get more information. And we usually send that out a couple days ahead of time just to make sure everyone can clear their schedule and make sure that uh, they're ready to go. And we usually ask people to log in 10 to 15 minutes early, mostly because of a bandwidth limitation. It's limited to the first 100 people who log on. They're the ones who get to hear what uh, what happens as we go live. Now for some reason if you get the information and you can't log in, you can't join us on that particular day, all of our webinars are recorded and they're available later on. Uh, they're available in two places. One is our YouTube channel. You can go to YouTube and search for University of Maryland FSE or you can find them on our website. Now if you've been with us before you may recognize this website. This is our old website at naturalresources.umd.edu. We're no longer updating that one, so that one is gone bye-bye. Our new one is extension.umd.edu slash woodland. Looks like this. Uh, it's, it went live about a month ago, so if you haven't seen it, uh, go over and take a look at it. Uh, what we did was we worked with the College of Agriculture and, Natu and Natural Resources, AGNR, to help us become part of the overall identity of AGNR. There were a lot of groups besides ours who had their their own websites, but they didn't have a consistent identity. So we now look the same with the school colors of red and black, and we've renamed ourselves slightly. We're the Woodland Stewardship Education Program, but it's the same group of people. Jonathan Kays, Nevin Dawson, Nancy Stewart, and myself. Uh, we're still doing the same thing, we just have a slightly different name. So go to extension.umd.edu slash woodland and you'll see on the right hand side a green tab that says resources and underneath that webinar recordings. That's where you'll find the recording for this and all of the others in the series. And we usually uh, send out a, another email to the listserv when the recording is available. And as I said, the uh, the website's only about a month old so if you haven't had a chance to explore it we invite you to do so. If you have a question during the webinar, the easiest way to get a hold of us is through the chat box in the lower left-hand corner. Go ahead and type something in there. We'll address your question during the presentation if we can. If, other, if we can't, we'll get to it at the end of the presentation. And if for some reason we, we run out of time in our, in our hour between now and 1 o'clock, we'll, uh, we'll email you the, the answer later on. And if you have any other questions, something occurs to you after uh, after you've seen the webinar, go ahead and drop me a line at acling1 at umd.edu and we'll get right back to you as soon as we can. Now before we get started, we have a few poll questions we need to go through. We need to find out a little bit about everybody who's with us today. And these are all very quick and what I'd like you to do is click on the answer that's most appropriate and you'll see the results displayed as, uh, as they come up. First question, what state do you live in? We've got some other folks as well. 
How many miles would you have to travel to your county extension office to attend this program if it was if it was offered at that location? And I certainly hope you know where your county extension office is. They have a lot of great resources that will uh, help you figure out what you need to do with your woodland. How did you find out about this webinar, either through our email or the branching out newsletter? And from a friend or a relative or a forestry organization. Okay, we're coming right along. Okay, we'll go ahead and close the first couple there. And you can see the results as we have them. And do you hunt or trap wildlife? Oh, it was 50-50 for a second there. And do you manage your property for wildlife? Okay, well, we will go ahead and close those polls and move on. And I'm going to bring in Tom in just a minute here, tell you a little bit about him. Tom, Tom is a lifelong resident of Allegheny County. He's a retired wildlife biologist, having worked in various capacities for the state of Maryland for 27 years. During the last five years of his career, he was the game program manager, and a large portion of his career was spent on habitat management for game species. Tom right now works as a contractor for the Wildlife Management Institute's Young Forest Initiative, and he volunteers as a member of the Allegheny County Forestry Board and the Green Ridge State Forest Advisory Board. So I'm going to hand the microphone over to Tom, and he's going to tell us all about Young Forest Initiatives and Young Forest Ecology. Well, thank you, Andrew. It's a, a real pleasure being able to participate in your Woodland Webinar series. Uh, and I really appreciate, as I looked at the poll up front, the interest in our uh, viewers today in habitat management for wildlife. And I uh, very appreciate their taking their time on a pretty spring day to uh, participate in our webinar. Uh, our first slide here, Appalachian Mountain Young Forest Initiative, is actually the technical term for uh, the work that I've been doing as a contractor with the Wildlife Management Institute. Uh, you can see here uh, in these various photos up front, uh, the key species is the woodcock. And the reason that I've got that uh, on the header slide here is that about 10 years ago, a group of uh, federal agencies, state collaborators, and private partners came together and collaborated on the development of the first national woodcock conservation plan. And uh, that effort was put together, and that was really the, the impetus uh, where I started to work uh, for the organization in facilitating the objectives of the Woodcock Initiative in Western Maryland. Uh, our slide here speaks to the fact that uh, state and federal agencies have recognized the need for young forest structure uh, increase. And another term that I'll play in right now is the term early successional. That's a term that uh, biologists actually use. We've, we use the term young forest more frequently because it uh, describes and appeals more to the layperson. But anyhow, uh, increase in, in early successional habitat warranted uh, uh, the development of the Woodcock Conservation Plan. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service named the Woodcock as a national focus species and other partners in flight in the North American Bird Conservation Initiative ranked the woodcock as the highest global priority species in need of conservation action. So there was a, a very strong uh, platform in need, if you will, for uh, addressing the declining woodcock population on a national scale. Uh, this issue is really founded in the change in forest structure, if you will, across the landscape. Uh, the five-county region that I work in, Maryland, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Virginia, and West Virginia, the, the graphic that we're looking at right now, and, and for some of our viewers, just let me define, if you will, the terms I'm going to use. Uh, seedling sapling refers to very young trees, I'll oh, say a half inch to two and a half inches in diameter. Uh, as the tree matures, it, it grows and, and moves into a pole-sized forest. Uh, these trees are about three to eight inches in diameter, or maybe a little larger, depending on your definition. But uh, salt timber then is, is, are trees about 14 inches or larger. Uh, the typical uh, 
landscape that we see in western Maryland is from immature pole to large salt timber. So that's give you an idea of what this graphic is going to show us. But if you look at the bar graph now uh, in Maryland, okay, you can see that the yellow, and let me see if I can get the uh, get the pointer working here. Okay. Okay, the yellow bar graph here uh, shows us in Maryland that that's the predominant age class on the landscape is salt timber with pole timber being the second and only just a little bit over 10% of the forested landscape is actually composed of seedling, sapling, or young forest. And if you look across the other five states, uh, this characteristic or uh, dynamic is about the same in all five of these states. Our next uh, graphic here shows you what has been the general trend, if you will, in forest structure for the last 25 or 30 years. Uh, again, if we look at Maryland, uh, in this, uh, this graphic here, this data is actually from the western four counties in Maryland. Uh, as you can see, it's a little different than the other four, four states. Uh, in, high, in Ohio, for instance, there's been a dramatic increase in salt timber with a very much almost 90% decrease in young forest structure. We've been more fortunate here in western Maryland to see a pretty nice increase in young forest, the blue graph. And the reason for that is that uh, if you're not, if our listeners aren't familiar with western Maryland, we have a large percentage of the land that is owned by uh, the Department of Natural Resources. Green Ridge State Forest in Allegheny County is almost 50,000 acres. Uh, up in Garrett County, Maryland, Savage River State Forest and Potomac Garrett State Forest comprise another 60 or 70,000 acres. And the state forest has a very active civil cultural forest management program ongoing to have for 30 or 40 years. And they harvest uh, approximately two to 300 acres or manage in some sort of civil cultural harvest regime. Uh, a lot of timber, which has resulted in some nice blocks of young forest. But the other, uh, particularly West Virginia and Ohio, you can see there's been a, a somewhat of a decrease uh, in that young forest structure for a number of years. So let's move forward here now uh, to another graphic. shows pretty much the same information, but uh, this is from the U.S. Forest Service. Every five years they do a comprehensive inventory in the Northeast. Uh, Maryland Forest Inventory, and, and just another way of depicting this information is that salt timber stands occupy about 66% of timberland, pole stands about 21%, and seedling saplings again about 11%. Uh, 1986 would be the light green, and 1999 would be the dark green. So in Maryland, not too much shift. Uh, in the uh, percentage of those uh, age classes on the landscape. Uh, the whole point of the Woodcock Conservation Plan was founded on this fact that young forest structure was declining. Uh, some of the reasons for the decline in this, uh, the technical term is maturation, but basically it's the aging of the forest, uh, forest maturation, uh, natural plant succession, you know, as uh, the trees continue to grow, uh, they move from young forest eventually into uh, salt timber stage stands and become less attractive and less valuable to those wildlife species that need the younger forest. We've also seen a decline in farmland abandonment, uh, particularly in the New England states. Uh, you know, from about 1950 or 60, we had a lot of uh, small farms, farmettes, that eventually went out of production. And for about 20 years, they provided excellent young forest habitat. But those farms now are beginning to grow back into forest. And so we're losing a lot of the young forest. And a lot of those lands now are, would be in the pole size stand. Uh, the other action that's occurring is we've got excellent our uh, fire suppression by our state fire control agencies. And in some respects, if uh, you know you, you want good wildlife habitat, a little bit of wildfire can be a good thing. So that's another factor. And a very significant factor is the impact of invasive plant species. Uh, we've seen in the last 20 to 30 years uh, just a host of different invasive plants 
that are very aggressive uh, and actually impact our native species and actually in a negative in a negative way uh, impact our ability to have native young forest. Again, uh, we're going to change gears later on, but the early part of my talk here is going to focus on the National Woodcock Plan. And this graphic here is showing us uh, in the last 40 years what has happened to our uh, woodcock populations in the Northeast. The graph here on the right, uh, the very dark colors, the darker the red, the very deep red, reflects a higher density of woodcock. All right, as you come south, uh, you see a little bit lighter density of woodcock. But look at this shift, if you will, from the graphic on the left to the graphic on the right. You can see over here we had some nice woodcock population, pretty good densities. Uh, far, as far south as Maryland and uh, northern Virginia. And over here now in the uh, 2000s, uh, the density of those birds has very much uh, went the wrong direction. Okay, so let's, uh, excuse me one second. Oh, okay, the, the technical guys here wanted to show my mug, so there I am. All right. Let's move now, if you will, to something that's a little easier to understand, and that is uh, this graphic. The uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has a very excellent and long-lived data set uh, on the uh, results of the Woodcock Singing Ground Surveys, which is the key survey done to monitor woodcock abundance. Okay, so if we look here uh, in the late 60s when this started, and again, this is in the eastern region, the area that we live in here. These are these reflect breeding population indices, or the number of birds heard per survey in 1968 was about three and a half to four. But look what has happened over the last 40 years. We've had a pretty much, a, on average, about a two percent decline in woodcock abundance, and it's no secret. Uh, Early in my career, I participated in some of these surveys, and some of the routes that we had in the central part of Maryland uh, actually now are shopping centers, highways, and in development. So once that habitat is lost, we lose that uh, great spot for woodcock. And nationally, you can see why there was much concern in the need to address the declining woodcock population. Another way of looking at this, again, if we look at Maryland here, in 1970, it was estimated we had approximately 2,500 singing male woodcock. In 2005, that was down to just under 1,100, or about a 56% decline in the male woodcock population, the singing males, during that last uh, 30 to 40-year uh, situation. Across the five-state region, that's just under, on average, about a 50% loss in woodcock abundance. So it is a serious problem. So how do we put the brakes on? What do we do? Uh, again, it's a habitat issue. Uh, some of the specialists in the field of woodcock management have, have looked at this, and they've uh, developed some formulas where they're saying that in Maryland, in order for us to restore populations back to that 1970 level, uh, during the next 10 years, we need to develop about 30,000 acres of young forest, or on average, about 3,000 acres per year. So it's a it's a very uh, significant issue. It's very optimistic that we would be able to do this. Probably not, but that is the goal or the uh, general direction that we like to try to get to. These other states, much larger larger states in Maryland, obviously have even more ambitious goals. The Woodcock Management Plan for Western Maryland then, is relatively straightforward. Uh, we want to halt the decline of woodcock populations to improve hunting and viewing opportunities. Uh, I noticed that about half of our viewers today are hunters. Uh, the woodcock has a great following both from the hunting community and also from the non-hunting community. Uh, the dance, they call it the sky dance of the woodcock here in the springtime, is a great uh, way for folks to experience nature. It's a very enjoyable bird. I'll get into that here in just a few minutes. But there's a lot of people and a lot of 
uh, interpretive programs that go on across the Northeast to provide enjoyment for birders and uh, outdoor enthusiasts. In addition, the woodcock's a great game bird because it holds well to pointing dogs and I uh, won't get into that this afternoon, but that's a great recreational activity to raise bird dogs and relate with the bird dog and become a companion as you uh, try to track and uh, learn about the, the woodcock and his haunts. The objectives of the plan are to achieve a population a positive growth, to turn around the decline that that one graphic showed, and create an additional uh, 24,000 of young forest habitat by 2018 or about that time. Okay, this is really the heart of the Woodcock Management Plan here in Maryland. Uh, the purpose of the plan was to develop and refine best management practices for woodcock through an adaptive process based on population response to habitat management initiatives. And what that really means simply is that uh, we're going to try different things and continue to adapt and refine the recipe for land management until we hit on something that really works. Uh, the objectives here are to develop and test best management practices. Uh, I'm going to show you here in just a few minutes about, uh, in fact, the year was 2008. The Wildlife Management Institute uh, published the state-of-the-art recipe for managing woodcock. And this booklet uh, is available. Uh, you can contact me by email, and I'll be glad to send you a copy. I've got a photograph of it here in just a minute. But that is the uh, best management practice is a term in the business that we use for what is the best recipe, what are actually the practices that you should employ on the landscape to uh, develop uh, good woodcock habitat. The second objective is to develop demonstration areas. And this is one of the uh, rewarding parts of my job the last few years. We have two excellent woodcock demonstration sites now in western Maryland. One is at the Kirk Orchard Track in southern Green Ridge State Forest. The other is located at the Mount Nebo Wildlife Management Area in Garrett County, Maryland. Uh, both of these sites have been managed for grouse and woodcock and golden winged warbler for a number of years. Uh, in the last five years, we've really ratcheted it up and even intensified that effort. And these are places that are designed for lay people and land managers and private landowners to go to and actually visually look and see the results. Habitat management is something that doesn't occur overnight. It's sort of like uh, you, you know, folks that do landscape work around their home. It takes a number of years to see the development of that. And this is why uh, these areas are so valuable, because you can go to one of these demonstration areas and actually see firsthand what we're talking about. Uh, the third objective is we obviously want to make sure that these uh, practices that we're employing are working. So we actually monitor woodcock response to habitat enhancements through singing ground surveys. And every spring, uh, I've been doing a singing ground survey at Kirk Orchard. And it's been very rewarding to see the number of singing male woodcock uh, increase uh, in response to the habitat work that we've employed there. The fourth objective is to increase awareness for the need for young forest habitats. Uh, again, that's what I'm doing today, is we're trying to get the word out uh, we want the public to be, uh, uh, become well-informed wildlife advocates, if you will, to become informed about the work of the need for young forest work and some of the practices that we can do to get there. The last objective is to provide funding for landowner implementation of the BMPs and monitoring efforts. And I can tell you right now that uh, in the part of the state that I work here in western Maryland, the Natural Resources Conservation Service has some great cost share money available to private landowners to do work for golden wing warbler. I'm going to get a little more into golden wing here at the end of my program. But this is a species that also requires patchy young forest hardwoods typically above 900 feet in elevation. They're only found in Maryland in the western part of the state. But anyhow, uh, if you follow the uh, guidelines provided by the Natural Resource Conservation Service, uh, you can get cost share funding for doing golden wing warbler habitat improvement on the scale of about three to $800 per acre. 
So it's pretty significant, and if you uh, if you got an inkling to look into that, contact your local office of the Natural Resource Conservation Service. Okay, this is the the book that I was referring to a moment ago. Uh, this book was published in December of 2008. Uh, it is the state of the art. A recipe manual for managing woodcock habitat. Uh, great picture of the bird here on the cover. Uh, don't have time today to get into the content of that. Go to the www.timberdoodle website uh, to get more information on how you can download a copy from the online source or you could uh, contact me and I'll send you a hard copy. Basically uh, the best management practices that are uh, detailed in this publication. Ultimately, we like to have a management unit for woodcock be three to five hundred acres. Now, I understand that. Uh, obviously, I saw most of the of the folks that have signed on today own property, but in a, only in a few small acres or so. Most private landowners in Western Maryland own about uh, twenty to forty acres, so it's very difficult for one individual to have all the elements of woodcock habitat on their property, but that should not should not discourage you from doing good work. Uh, first off, let's understand what should be done. Uh, feeding areas. These are moist, rich soils with abundant earthworms and a dense regenerating forest with more than 10,000 stems per acre. Uh, woodcock feed where the soil is moist, alder flats along rivers and wetlands, abandoned farmland, uh, overgrown orchards, and clear cuts up to 20 years. These are places that provide crucial habitat not only for woodcock, but for songbirds and mammals and amphibians and many turtles such as the boxwood and bog turtles. Uh, nesting and brooding cover for woodcock are dense regenerating young hardwoods adjacent to singing grounds. And these are places where woodcock raise their young in stands of hardwoods less than 20 years old, uh, where the saplings are thick, so thick that maybe a person might even have trouble getting through them. But in addition to good habitat for woodcock, the alder and the willow flycatchers thrive in these areas, as do uh, snowshoe hares further north of Maryland and cottontail rabbits. Uh, singing grounds, these are areas uh, where the male does its courtship in the spring. There's small openings, a quarter to a half acre in size, and we'd like to have for every 300 acre track of land about four of these. Uh, the singing grounds attract males in the spring. The male woodcock call and make dawn and dusk courtship flights from these clearings and log landings. Old fields and road edges also serve the same purpose, and these openings are also heavily used by many songbirds. Uh, the last element of a woodcock habitat on the landscape is very crucial are what we call roosting areas. Now roosting areas are, are much larger than singing grounds. They, can be, they should be at least three acres in size and we want to have at least one roosting area for every hundred acres of the landscape. At dusk in the summer and early fall, uh, woodcock fly to these weedy fields and newly log woods where they roost beneath patchy plant growth that protects them from both land and aerial predators. Uh, another declining bird species that needs these semi-open habitats is the whippoorwill. So even though we're talking here a lot about woodcock, uh, there's a lot of other wildlife that benefit from the similar habitat. Uh, what are some of, the, uh, some of the potential partners, if you will, that we've been working with? Well, I've had just excellent cooperation in the last five years with the Department of Natural Resources. I've met with uh, the land managers for the state parks, <coughs> excuse me, the state parks and wildlife management areas, uh, they're very much interested in this work and they take every opportunity where they can uh, to develop young forests on these public land holdings. But also uh, private landowners are, are a critical component of this. Uh, the Nature Conservancy owns many lands in western Maryland. We have hunting clubs and farmers and other private groups. And I heard uh, in an NRCS meeting last week on the Woodcock or the Golden Wing Woodward cost share, there's been a very much, I think she had about 11 or 12 interested landowners already uh, interested in uh, the cost share money and improving their land for the Golden Wing Warbler. Okay, uh, 
Back in uh, 1976, up at the Moosehorn National Wildlife Refuge in Maine, uh, they did a project where they started to increase by active management the habitat for woodcock. And a lot of this country up here is very much alder thickets. And they went in and, and regenerated the alder, made the landscape a very stem thick density, created singing grounds and roosting fields. And what this graphic here is showing us is from 1976 to 2000, there was very much an upward trend in the response of woodcock to that active management, which was very great to see. But what they did at the same time was there were a number of other bird species in this whole list here. These were about a dozen or so other bird species that responded positively in an also increased population manner to the work that was originally uh, focused on woodcock. So again, we're just making the point that management does work, and there were just a lot of species that responded. There were a few species that did not respond. Uh, these are species, uh, you know, every wildlife has its own niche, and young forest is not for every wildlife species. But there is an element out there uh, that does re result positively to young forest work. These are examples of other young forest species that you would expect to see in this habitat. Uh, we have the white-throated sparrow, the alder flycatcher, the American red start, of course the golden-winged warbler, cottontail rabbit, wood turtle, and the blue-winged warbler. These are all species that you would expect to find in a young forest habitat. Okay, uh, state wildlife action plans. This is a something that's found within the Wildlife Conservation Agency about every state. But these, uh, the term State Wildlife Action Plan identifies species of greatest conservation need. And uh, these, these plans, if you will, are well thought out. And they outline steps to conserve species of greatest conservation need in their habitats. And these plans in aggregate form a national action agenda to prevent wildlife becoming endangered. Uh, for an example right now, the golden winged warbler, although it's not endangered, uh, we have some real concerns about it. And on many states, I'm sure that golden winged warbler would be, one of, would be a species of greatest conservation need. So let's look forward here to uh, the species of greatest conservation need. They identify the need for young forest structure. And I realize that this graphic is a little, for, little hard for you to see, but Simply put here, we're looking at a uh, pole to mature size forest. And after we might clear cut that forest, there's a number of species that respond positively as the young forest begins to grow back. In the zero to five year term, we're going to see increases in olive-sided flycatcher, willow flycatcher, and morning warbler. Uh, four to eight years, we're going to see increases in the chestnut-sided warbler and the veery. Uh, from beginning from zero out to 20 years, great habitat for woodcock, and from about eight to 20 years, good habitat for rough grouse. So these are just some examples, if you will, of uh, what species and what response we might anticipate uh, if we do active development of young forest. Maryland's Wildlife Action Plan identifies young forest habitat as a key wildlife habitat that supports a number of wildlife species of greatest conservation needs. And that's great to see that they've addressed that. Uh, there's also some consequences over the debate of forest management methods. And in the last all 10 or 15 years or so, on many of our national forests, I know down the Jefferson National Forest, the Rough Grouse Society has been very much involved uh, trying to get the folks on the National Forest to cut more timberland on that forest track. But a lot of the protectionist, uh, the bad uh, mark that the term clear cutting has got, uh, a lot of the problems with logging when done incorrectly. Over this, this debate ongoing, that one of the, the negatives of that has been the loss of the ability to develop young forest on the landscape. I thought I'd throw in a few slides here on uh, basic woodcock ecology. Uh, you never know in the audience how familiar we are. And it's, I think it's important that the listeners 
have a basic understanding of woodcock ecology. Uh, this is a very interesting migratory game bird. Uh, the courtship starts here in uh, early to mid-April. Uh, these birds, you heard me use the term, is singing at dusk. Uh, I'm going to try to imitate here, if you will, what this bird sounds like uh, right around evening or also right before daylight in the morning. The male woodcock uh, has a sound that goes sort of like this. They call that a paint. And if you've ever been able to witness that, it's quite enjoyable. It's very humorous in a way. But the, the male woodcock paints on the ground. And then in a few minutes, it'll fly skyward about 100 feet above the earth. And uh, if you listen very intently as it flies, it tweeters. It flies in a figure eight pattern, faster and faster and faster. And then just like on a switch, it drops right back down to the earth, many times right within a foot or two of where it flew up. Very enjoyable. Uh, you'd have to wonder the adaptation and why that's developed, but uh, it seems to work for the woodcock. The woodcock usually lays a nest at the base of a tree near the forest edge. Uh, two to four eggs are pretty common. Uh, after the eggs are laid, it incubates the clutch uh, for about 20 days or so, and the chicks leave the nest immediately. And I had a report, ironically, just yesterday from a turkey hunter in Greenridge State Forest that actually came upon a woodcock and her couple-day-old young. And uh, the woodcock did the typical broken wing act to distract you from her young, but he was able to see these very small, just out of the egg, woodcock young, which is uh, not something that you can uh, see very often in the wild. They're usually pretty secretive. Woodcock have a very specialized diet. Uh, a very large percentage of their diet is earthworms. Uh, they have a very specialized, flexible bill. It's over two inches long. And if you can think about how that might work, they probe down into the forest floor to grab the worm. But only the very tip, just the very tip of that beak has a hinge on it. So they can open up that hinge when two inches down, grab the earthworm, and pull it back up. Very important that we have moist soils, which is a key component, along with dense vegetation. Uh, for this bird to do its foraging. Moist soils many times along field edges are preferred. And here's a, uh, just another, uh, well, while we got this great photograph here, you can see how camouflaged the woodcock is and how well it blends in to the leaf litter uh, on the forest floor. Here's some a great photograph of some very typical woodcock habitat. Uh, this would be a great feeding area. You can see the moisture in the forefront. Uh, wet soils here, great dense vertical stems. They like six to 8,000 stems per acre. Great places for earthworms, and I'm sure you'd find woodcock in that habitat. This is the singing ground habitat I made reference to earlier. Uh, these are small forest clearings, uh, and you can see relatively close to the feeding area. And again, at dusk, this is where you would expect to hear the sky dance and listen for the paint of the woodcock. This is a graphic just to show you that you need all these elements of woodcock habitat in relatively close proximity. Here we have an old field, a pasture for roosting. We have 5, 10, and 15 year different age classes of young forest. We have a forest opening. All this stuff, all these elements uh, within a relatively small 300 acre area would result in good woodcock habitat. And this graphic here is a, a great graphic showing you uh, and this would be your, your diurnal feeding area. This would be the roosting area. And back here are some openings for singing ground. This is a great uh, picture of woodcock habitat. And I think this next one uh, is actually going to show you, I forgot I had this in here. This is the, actually showing you what I just mentioned a few minutes ago. OK, I've thrown in a few slides now of actually some uh, coverage or habitat areas in western Maryland. This is on the Warrior Mountain Wildlife Management Area uh, up here in Allegheny County, Maryland. This is a stand uh, that was a, at one time an overstory. Uh, it was an old field 50 years ago. It grew back into Virginia pine. The Virginia pine became mature, and we cut it off, and it responded back in musclewood. 
a great woodcock habitat right now. Okay. This stand. This is a photograph here, also in the Warrior Mountain Wildlife Management Area. Of uh, this is probably a early summer photograph, but it shows you in the foreground we have a lot of goldenrod coming in, and some nice dense understory in the back. This was probably a good singing ground in April. Another element of migratory habitat up our way is these very nice mature stands of hawthorn. Hawthorn, or sometimes it's known as white thorn, uh, gets a, a like a crab apple, small apple fruit on it, which provides uh, great food for a lot of different wildlife species. But when found in this uh, dynamic here with this understory of goldenrod, in this nice shaded area uh, for mo keeping the moisture in. This is a great place to find woodcock. They migrate through western Maryland in late October to early November. And uh, game bird, uh, the guys that hunt woodcock, uh, they'll spend a lot of time in the woods there during those two weeks trying to catch those migratory or what we call flight birds coming through. All right. We got a question. I'm going to digress here a minute from Tom Ward from uh, Greensboro, North Carolina. Tom asks, since it's a game bird, could you describe how it's prepared and what it tastes like? Well, that's a good question, Tom. I have can, can have to uh, say that I've only ever had woodcock probably once. I'm not really a woodcock hunter myself. I have other passions. You just can't do it all. Uh, but I understand that the woodcock has a, a pretty dark meat and it takes some special preparation. It's a little gamey. Uh, but there are, I'm sure if you go online, uh, the Rough Grouse Society has a great publication and I'm sure that you can get some good recipes uh, by going maybe to the Rough Grouse uh, publication or other online sources. Sorry, I can't do better than that. Uh, this is a habitat uh, up on uh, what we call the Appalachian Plateau in western Maryland. Uh, Allegheny County is a relatively dry county. Only about 600 acres of the landscape is in forested wetlands. In Garrett County we have, have over 6,000 acres of forested wetlands. And this is a very typical photograph where the core area has a lot of moisture and results in uh, very little tree growth. But the perimeter of the wetland area, okay, if you go around here, has a lot of nice young forest coming in, and this would be a pretty classic habitat for woodcock in western Maryland. I'm going to test your eyes on this shot here. Uh, see if you can see we have a hen woodcock on nest. And I'll give you just a minute here to take a look. Uh, very difficult to see, but right back here, right above my pointer, is the nesting hen woodcock. This is a pretty typical spot, and I think my next photo will actually show this bird uh, in a little better format, better closer up. This is the same photograph. You can see the, the beak of the bird here. Uh, just like grouse and woodcock and turkeys, once they get very close to hatching their eggs, they'll set very tight and let you approach, which is what happened with uh, this photograph here a couple years ago. We had a great thing happen here a couple years ago. Uh, we had a biologist that was a longtime advocate of woodcock and grouse habitat. He was employed by the Fish and Wildlife Service at Patuxent, Maryland. His name was his nickname was Al, but it was Alred Geis. And this is a photograph here. Uh, Al died here about three years ago, and he left a nice sum of money in his estate to be dedicated for woodcock and grouse habitat improvement in Maryland. And this next uh, plaque here sort of says it all. Uh, again, this work was done up at the demonstration area in Garrett County at the Mount Nebo Wildlife Management Area, uh, the Al Geis Memorial Woodcock Habitat Demonstration Area. It was a collaborative effort between the Maryland DNR, the Rough Grouse, and the Wildlife Management Institute. Uh, great project. Uh, we've been doing some state-of-the-art work there to create woodcock and grouse habitat. And my next few slides here are going to show you, uh, it was the first time to my knowledge that we did uh, some active uh, work on regenerating alder on a public land in Maryland. Uh, the, the loggers that did the work were the Furman Brothers Logging from Garrett County, Maryland. Uh, 
I think these guys actually won the Master Logger of the Year Award a couple years before this, but they did this work in very harsh conditions uh, in the dead of winter when the ground was frozen, so there was almost no impact on the soil. This was a photograph I took one winter morning uh, while they were actively working. Uh, ground was frozen. Uh, great job they did. I uh, can't say enough about the work they did. This is a tree harvester, one of the tools they used uh, to harvest the trees. Uh, has a large pincher mechanism where they can walk up to a tree and hydraulically harvest the tree with uh, very little uh, very little impact, if you will, uh, to the soils below because we work working in a moist soil environment on the perimeter of a forested wetland. Uh, this project was uh, about eight acres in size. Each of the tracts of land were about half to, to an acre in size. Uh, looks a little ugly, if you will. Let me back up a minute. Uh, this is uh, from a lot of people that look at the landscape and see it clear cut. Yes, initially it looks pretty trashy looking, but from a, uh, from a habitat manager's perspective, this is really good looking stuff because we know that in a few years, this, the sunlight is going to reach the forest floor here, and we're going to get a great flush of new growth providing insects and cover and structure and the type of plant composition and diversity that we really need for these young forest wildlife. You've heard me make reference to alder. Uh, alder in, uh, is, is a type of plant that's it's not a tree, it's a shrub. It grows in wet, moist soil environments and higher altitudes. Uh, when it gets very old, and this plant here could be 30, 40, 50 years old, Instead of having the nice, dense vertical structure that we want, we begin to get these large branches growing horizontally. And this is not, although it would continue to provide woodcock habitat, this is not maximizing the best situation for woodcock because we need to cut this off and get a lot of good young sprouts coming up so that the woodcock can, can be under, the, under this thick vegetation. And I think the next couple of slides here, well, we'll get to it here in just a minute, but this is an aerial photograph of that project on the Mount Nebo site. And what we did, we would cut a strip from about 100 feet upslope down to the edge of the wetland. We would then leave a strip, cut a strip, leave a strip, cut a strip, et cetera, around the perimeter of this wetland. Another one here. Again, there was eight or nine of these uh, harvested areas, each of them just under an acre. And what happens in the next couple years we begin to see nice forest regeneration. This is not alder, this is a plant called aspen. Aspen is a great plant for both woodcock and grouse. Actually this is not, each of these little sprouts is not one tree. The, the, uh, this is all one plant. The root system of this is all interconnected by a rhizome is the term we use. In fact, uh, I listened to a professor from Frostburg give a talk a couple weeks ago and, and learned that out west there's a uh, five or 5,000 acre tract of land, all connected aspen, all one plant that they think is one of the oldest living plants uh, in the country. Very interesting species. But the thing about aspen is it's very valuable for woodcock, but even more valuable for rough grouse. Uh, this graphic here shows you the range of rough grouse and aspen. Didn't have time today to get into the ecology of rough grouse, but it is another game bird that's native to western Maryland. Uh, we are on the very southern edge of its range in the nation. Uh, you can see the aspen here uh, is, is this whole area. It almost overlaps the range of the rough grouse. Uh, the rough grouse can very much adapt to harsh winter conditions. It burrows what we call snow roosting under the snow to get away from the elements. And it can fly up in the top of the aspen trees and actually eats the buds of the aspen tree for its primary food source in the winter months. Grouse are found here in Maryland just in the western four counties. This is a regenerating stand at Mount Nebo of alder after just one growing season. Uh, once we let that sun hit that forest floor, it grows back very prolifically. In, in just a few years, it's going to look pretty good. This is that same picture I showed you a moment ago that looked very trashy, and this is in July. 
just three months after this area was cut over. Okay. All right. Another site is showing you how fast this stuff grows back. We have some asters, asters. We have uh, goldenrod. We have alder, all in just one year. In three or four years, I'm sure it's going to be way over the head of this. Uh, this is Rick Ladshaw, who is the area manager uh, at Mount Nebo. Okay, uh, just a few slides on golden wing warbler. Uh, golden wing warbler is another species that very much needs this young forest component. A little different than woodcock, it does not need the moist soil element as much as the woodcock do, but uh, this is the website which I can refer you to for another publication, which is the state-of-the-art recipe for managing golden wing warbler. And uh, if, I'm sure you can find that. If you have a problem with it, email me and I'll make sure I can send you the link to get that uh, resource. Uh, golden wings are one of 50 species of birds in the eastern U.S. that re rely on young forest habitat. And uh, it's a clear, while it's clearly important for species that use it for breeding, they also use it for post-fledging or when they're shortly out of the nest. And they also use it for migratory stopover habitat uh, during the fall migration period. Young forest stands that are 5 to 10 years of post-harvest provide the highest value. And there are about 17 species of birds that depend on young forests for experiencing these population declines. OK, we're just about wrap up. And then I'm going to try to answer some of the questions that I see coming in. Uh, but this sort of gives you the sense uh, of what we're trying to do here with this young forest work. I'm going to leave this slide up for just a moment. Uh, this is my contact information. And very importantly, I want you to look at these two websites. Timberdoodle.org was the first website that was a result of the Woodcock Conservation Plan Initiative. And now uh, the more recent website is youngforest.org. And this website is just full of resources for you to uh, learn more about the Young Forest Initiative. There's some PowerPoints on there. There's various publications. A uh, great, very uh, up-to-date resource that's constantly updated as new information comes around. OK, let me go back here now. Uh, I think we have a few minutes left and see if we can see what questions I may have lost here. OK, Tom asks, the most practical way to create early successional forest is with a timber harvest. The poor housing market has resulted in a big decline in timber harvest infrastructure, loggers, truckers, sawmills, etc. Some of this infrastructure may be gone for good due to an aging workforce and cost of getting restarted. Uh, Tom, I'd have to agree with you 100% on that. Uh, one of the private consultant foresters that I work with in Allegheny County right now has eight different landowners ready to harvest timber. But the forest product operators, the contractors, the loggers that do that work just aren't available. So uh, it's very much a changing dynamic. I really don't know what the, uh, what the future is going to bring on that. Jonathan says that many loggers and foresters have gone to work with gas, oil, and utility companies. And that would be correct. All right, Tom also asked, since it's a game bird, could you describe how it's prepared and what? OK, we are, we've already addressed that. And, Tom's also come back to me with a great recipe he's already found on the website. So uh, there you go. Ruth asked, <coughs> why should the government and citizens put money into habitat for a game bird given all the other priorities of environmental restoration like saving the bay? Uh, again, this project, Ruth, is not just for game birds. Uh, there are between 40 and 60 species of wildlife that benefit from young forests. So it's really not a focus on a game bird. It's more of a focus on a habitat element that's uh, very much decreasing in its presence on the landscape and the whole cohort of wildlife species that uh, is going to benefit from uh, seeing more young forest. OK, we have a question here from Karen. Uh, woodcock depend on, com on a complex of habitats that without active management will not be present. Young forest and a combination of open areas, et cetera, require woodcock in chunks of 
crop habitat, protecting habitats for, okay, so I guess she's answered the previous question for that uh, question. Tom says, aspen is in steep decline wherever it grows due to a short lifespan and lack of harvest. It is rather quickly replaced by other trees if it's not clear cut in blocks of at least 10 acres in size, and that would be correct. And Karen asked, as a ground nesting bird, what was is the impact of feral cats on reproductive success? Uh, Karen, I can't speak specifically to the impact of feral cats on woodcock, but I can tell you that feral cats uh, have a more than significant impact on small wildlife across the United States. In fact, uh, just about within the last year, I saw somewhere a new study, a research study that came out even quantifying more uh, what the uh, impact of that has done. And, and Molly now is uh, posted on here a link. Are they seeing this also? Yes, good. Molly, thank you for that link regarding, uh, regarding feral cats. Okay, folks, why well, I really moved along here. I've tried to cover a lot of information in a short period of time. We have just about two minutes left. If you have any follow-up questions, we'll be glad to answer those. Uh, if not, just to remind you to please uh, send me your email if you'd like a copy of that Woodcock BMP. Okay, I'm going to hand the mic back to uh, Andrew for, for wrap-up comments. Thanks a lot, Tom. There's a lot of great information there. And if you miss something, you can always look for the recording when we, uh, when we get it posted. But before we go, a couple of things we need to do. I want to come back to, uh, to a couple of things here. We need to get you to answer a few poll questions. And if you go ahead and uh, give us some feedback on all of these as soon as they come up. Okay. We'll go ahead and, and close a couple of these. We'll close the first one. We'll go ahead and close the second one and the third one. Okay, I think we've gotten feedback from just about everybody who's who's with us. So we'll go ahead and close those up. Okay. And one more, if you would, please. One more section here. And the one down here in the middle on the bottom might be a little hard to, to figure out. What I have learned from this webinar will save me the following amount of money over the next year. Think of it this way. How much would it cost for, for someone to, uh, to come out to your property and give you all of this information? I know Tom's a consultant. I don't know exactly what his rate is, but uh, he, he's he's shaking and holding up 40, 50. Uh, no, uh, he, he's he's chuckling. But go ahead and, and give us an estimate of how much it might might cost for actually uh, to have a professional come out and and take a look and see what you have to have to do for Young Forest Ecology on your on your site. Okay, we appreciate you folks hanging off, hanging on with us. Just about done here. And I'd like to remind you that we have one more webinar scheduled for next month this time. And that's Brian Eiler, who's going to be joining us. He's the Deer Project Leader for the Maryland Department of Natural Resources. He's going to be telling us about deer management in Maryland. And if you're not on our listserv, our email notification list, you can drop me a line at akling1 at umd.edu. Join us that way. And we do have another one hopefully coming up in June, but that is just tentative at the moment. So thank you for stopping by today. Go out and enjoy the spring weather, and we'll see you again next time. <laughs>